Welcome to today's lesson on disc brakes. Before we begin, please make sure you've downloaded and have access to the worksheets that we're going to be using. Disc brakes actually have five main advantages over brake drums, and these are as follows. With brake discs, the actual friction surface, or the majority of the friction surface, is exposed to air. And that allows the heat to escape and radiate away from the disc much, much more effectively than it does on an enclosed brake drum. This gives much better resistance to brake fade, which is when the actual brake overheats and gets so hot that the friction surfaces will not actually grip on one another. Number two is that although the disc brake is not as powerful size for size as a drum brake and will require more effort to actually stop the car, it is actually far more progressive. You don't have the self servo action interfering with that, giving you this spike in pressure that you get with drum brake. So it's much easier to, to modulate the brake with a disc brake. Number three, brake pads are self-adjusting and they don't need a built-in adjuster to do it they do it just through use of the seals which we're going to have a look at later and something that's actually dear to most mechanics heart is brake pads are much easier to replace number four unlike with a brake drum which as it gets hot the drum expands and moves away from the brake shoes brake discs as they expand actually move closer so you don't get an increase in brake pedal travel when the brake gets hot. The last one we have here is that the actual weight of the brake discs or disc brakes they're usually lighter than that of drum brakes which helps with unsprung mass and making a smoother ride giving the suspension an easier time. What I'd like you to do now is pause the video and complete the relevant worksheet on this page. Now what I'd like you to do is watch How Disc Brakes Works by Auto Tech Labs on YouTube and there is a link to this video in your worksheets. What we're going to do now is have a look at the three main types of different brake caliper and a little bit on the construction of each. So the first one we're going to look at is the two piston caliper where you have two pistons, one for each brake pad operating on each side of the disc and each piston pushes in a brake pad towards the disc giving us our clamping action. One of the important constructional features of the actual brake caliper, and this is all not just the two piston, is the use of a square cut fluid seal. This fluid seal is not only there to stop the fluid leaking out past the piston, but it also allows the piston to retract and pull the brake pad off of the brake disc when you finish braking. It does this by distorting ever so slightly when the piston moves outwards. The seal stays into contact with the actual piston and moves a small amount. When the pressure is released, the, the actual seal itself wants to go back to its original shape and pulls the piston back with it. As the brake pad wears, the actual amount of the seal can distort is no longer enough to take up the movement of the piston. So the piston slides against the seal, taking up the actual extra wear of the brake pad. Fluid from the actual master cylinder reservoir comes in and fills the extra space in the fluid chamber behind the piston. This is the reason we always take the reservoir cap off when we're actually changing brake pads as the extra fluid in there 
could spill out over the top. If we left the cap on, the small vent hole that's in the top of the cap would allow the fluid to slightly pressurize and we'd have a high pressure jet of brake fluid spraying out all over the engine plate. And as we learned previously, as brake fluid damages the paintwork, this could mean that we're left with an expensive bill to actually repair the paintwork that got damaged from that. So please do remember, whenever we're changing brake pads, take the cap off. I'd like you to pause this video now and go back and complete the previous two worksheets. In addition to the actual pressure seal, there is an outer dust seal that's actually fitted to brake caliper pistons. And that's just to stop any water or any dust or dirt that could cause corrosion or seizure of the piston stops all that getting in there and keeps the piston moving freely. So despite the fact that we have two pistons here, in all likelihood you're going to only see one brake hose going down to this style of caliper. To get the fluid from one side of the caliper to the other, there's internal drillings. And those internal drillings also connect both of the actual piston fluid chambers to the bleed nipple so we can actually bleed air out of the caliper if we've gone into the system and allowed air to get in. So that's our first type of brake caliper, the two piston caliper. A variation on the two piston caliper is the multi piston caliper. And this is the type of caliper that you might see on high performance vehicles or even on heavier vehicles as well. And the difference here is we have multiple pistons fitted to the actual brake caliper. We might have three, four, even up to eight piston calipers fitted to each caliper on the car. More pistons means more surface area for the brake fluid to press against, which means more pressure on the brake pad, more clamping force of the brake pads against the brake disc. As these brake calipers are bigger, it's quite common, particularly on the performance variants, to actually see them made of an aluminium alloy to make them that much lighter and improve the unsprung weight. The third type of brake caliper that you're likely to come across is the floating or sliding brake caliper. With modern front wheel drive cars having their wheels heavily inset, this left a lot less space for the brake caliper. This in turn meant we didn't have enough space on the outside of the brake caliper to fit the extra piston. So floating or sliding calipers actually use a single piston that are mounted in a sliding housing. The operation of these is slightly different to a two piston caliper. The fluid still enters the fluid chamber behind the piston and that still pushes the piston out against the brake pad which pinches against the brake disc. The clever bit here is that the fluid pressure also acts against the back of the chamber and the caliper housing itself. Because this isn't rigidly mounted to the anchor bracket, the caliper can then slide across, pulling the other brake pad into contact with the brake disc on the other side. This double action of the actual brake caliper piston and the brake caliper body working in unison together means that the actual force of the brake, or the power of the brake if you like, actually is very very similar to a brake caliper with double the amount of pistons of a single piston floating or sliding caliper. So now what I'd like you to do is pause the video again, complete the worksheet before continuing.
have brake discs generally manufactured from grey cast iron. That's a really good, easy material to machine. It's got good heat stability, which is why it's the material of choice. You might find on some higher performance vehicles that they're using ceramic or carbon fiber based discs, but it is still the case for the, for the vast majority of vehicles, you're gonna see them manufactured from cast iron. The brake disc itself is attached to the actual wheel hub in some fashion, typically bolted or quite commonly using the actual wheel bolts themselves and will turn at wheel speed. By slowing down the rotation of the actual brake disc, we're gonna slow down the wheel. The other thing of note is there are two main different constructions of brake disc, either solid, as you can see in the image on the left-hand side, or ventilated, as in the image on the right-hand side, that allows airflow between the actual two friction surfaces to better cool the brake. Solid brake discs are still used in a number of applications if it's a small, light car, or indeed if the car's not particularly powerful. But as soon as we actually get up to a certain power or a certain vehicle weight, we're gonna find that having the two sides of the friction surface attached means the amount of heat we can put into the brake means it'll overheat. It just can't cool fast enough. On ventilated discs, the two friction surfaces are separated and that allows air to get in between and allows for much faster cooling of the actual brake disc. The sectioned image on the right hand side shows the most common layer of this, just straight veins. But other methods of actually joining the two surfaces are available, including curved veins or the design that you see here on the left hand side. It isn't unusual to actually see both ventilated and solid discs fitted to the same vehicle. Ventilated discs fit to the front of the vehicle, solid discs fitted to the rear. And this is because under braking, we have far more braking force on the front of the wheels due to low transfer under braking. And the front brakes having to do Around 70% of the work due to this load transfer means they're going to get much hotter, they're going to have to cope with much more heat, and that's the reason for fitting the ventilated disc onto those. In addition to ventilated and solid discs, it's not uncommon to see other types, including drilled, grooved, or even drilled and grooved brake discs. These are designed to improve braking performance as under hard braking, some of the actual brake pad itself begins to vaporize and turn into gas. The grooves the, or the drillings actually give a, an escape route for that and prevents it pushing the brake pad against or away from the brake disc. It also allows for any brake dust to escape from the clamping surface and also helps deglaze the brake pads. One of the problems with this is the drillings actually do weaken the disc and can actually promote cracks, which would become very, very dangerous if left unattended. Moving on to brake pads. The pads themselves are usually made by bonding a friction material to a steel backing plate. Now that steel backing plate is, is needed to give some sort of mechanical integrity to the brake pad itself as the piston is going to be pushing against that surface. The friction material isn't normally mechanically strong enough to cope with that action on its own, so we use the steel backing plate. Whilst it used to be the case that brake pad friction material was made of asbestos because it does have a number of good properties, including its ability to cope with heat, its quietness of operation and its wear properties, it's such a dangerous substance from a health point of view that other materials had to be found. 
In general, these days, we're likely to find one of four different types of materials used. First of those is non-metallic, and these are gentle on the discs, but do produce quite a lot of brake dust and do have quite a short service life. We also get semi-metallic materials, and this is where a non-metallic has been mixed with flaked metals. And these are a bit harder and more fade resistant uh, compared to the uh, non-metallic non pad. But they do cause the brake disc itself to wear and they do have a lower coefficient of friction, which is a problem in terms of brake performance. You might sometimes see fully metallic materials advertised, but these are really only for racing use. They, they are long lasting, they cope with heat very, very well, but they do wear the discs really fast and they tend to be very, very noisy. Not what you want on a road car. This leads on to our final material, our ceramic materials. And these are a really good compromise on the others because they do offer really good durability, a good coefficient of friction, they tend to be low noise and they have good fade resistance. The problem with these is they don't tend to absorb the heat very well. So all of the heat has to be absorbed by the brake disc, which could lead the actual brake disc to warp. Whenever we rub two surfaces together, we create friction. The amount of friction can be expressed as a coefficient of friction, and that's mu. That's the funny little squiggly U that you see on the screen there. That coefficient of friction for most brake pads falls somewhere between 0.35 to 0.42 mu, but it can be as high as 0.5 or even as low as 0.3. And the problem with this is if we end up fitting a brake pad with a coefficient of friction of 0.3 to a car that was originally designed or the braking system was originally designed for a coefficient of 0.5, it means our braking system just isn't going to perform properly. We're going to find the pedal pressure is much, much higher than it should be. Now, pause the video and complete the worksheet. Now what I'd like you to do is watch the video clip, choose the right brake pad by Donut Media, and there is a link in your worksheets. Still on the subject of brake pads, we'll take a quick look at the wear indicators. These fall into two main types, either mechanical or electrical. Dealing with the mechanical one first, you can see in the picture here, the piece of metal that's actually bent round alongside the brake pad is our mechanical warning device. That thin piece of metal is away from the brake disc in this picture, but as the brake pad begins to wear down and wears down to its limit, that piece of metal comes in contact with the disc. As it does, it vibrates and creates a loud squealing noise that gives the driver a warning that this, the brake pads have worn out and there's something wrong that they're gonna to have to take the car to a garage. Pause the video and complete the worksheet. With the electrical type, what we've got is a soft metal sensor that's actually embedded into the brake pad itself. And that's connected to a warning light somewhere on the dashboard. When the pads wear down to their wear limit, that sensor touches the brake disc. And the light uses that sensor and the brake disc as an earth point, and that causes the light to come on on the dash. The problem we have here is we are reliant on having a good connection between the actual brake disc and the sensor to give that earth circuit to bring the light on. So manufacturers started using a two-wire sensor 
but actually we relied on the sensor itself being rubbed through and breaking a circuit to bring the light on. The problem people, or the problem that, that we were seeing was that some people would actually, rather than replacing their brake pads, actually bridge it out to bypass that. So these days it's much more likely to see a resistor somewhere in the system so that the light will come on if you try to bridge this out or it will come on if the actual sensor wire is broken. Pause the video and complete the worksheet. It's not uncommon for cars fitted with disc brakes front and rear to need a handbrake typically at the rear of the vehicle. Now this can be done just by fitting a small handbrake drum, so this is just operated by the handbrake itself, on the inside surface of the brake disc, as you can see in the picture here. An alternative that you can find is shown here, where we've got a handbrake mechanism fitted inside the actual brake caliper itself, and this mechanism actually pushes the piston out into contact with the brake pads, pulling them onto the disc, and it's the brake pads that operate the handbrake. Pause the video here and complete the worksheet. So that's us just about done. I've uploaded a copy of this presentation for you onto Teams so you can access it at any time. And of course you can come back and actually watch this video whenever you like. The final worksheet in your pack is the beginnings of a mind map. And I strongly suggest that you actually make use of this and try to make your own notes, keeping in mind all the rules of mind mapping including one word per branch and the use of color, as this will help you revise for our upcoming test. Thanks very much. See you soon.